Howdy partners. That's what Starbucks calls their employees. Get it? You get it. You're so smart and you look nice today. Enough lies. I once tried to spearhead the unionization of the Starbucks I worked at after almost 10 years of dealing with their bull whip. It did not go well. I, however, accept no responsibility for this because the buck, as it were, stops there. Starbucks has built its brand on being liberal, leftist even, environmentally friendly, woke. But as each year passes, that reputation slips farther away from them, as does the public perception of Howard Schultz, a man once celebrated as a working class hero, a man who not only ran a company right, but treated his employees right. But in March 2023, this facade that he worked so hard to build, including writing books publishing this lie, would come crashing down on him. And that's because Howard Schultz, former kitchenware salesman, ex-CEO of Starbucks, and a person of wealth, was forced to testify to the United States Senate under threat of subpoena as part of a hearing called No Company is Above the Law, the need to end illegal union busting at Starbucks. The face-off at the hearing with Bernie Sanders herself was heated, and you can understand why when you remember that Schultz threatened the whole world with an independent presidential run to split the vote should the Democrats not elect a centrist, which is just a long way of saying if they elect someone on the left, specifically Bernie Sanders, because Bernie was pro-worker and pro-union. Schultz did his very best to not only appear sympathetic to Starbucks workers, but to show himself as one of the few true hopes for the future of capitalism itself. He attempted to portray himself as a man of the people, of the everyday workaday laborer, despite being there to defend himself and his company against being found to have broken labor laws literally hundreds of times and engaging in what Sanders called the most aggressive and illegal union busting campaign in the modern history of our country. To really hammer it all home, one Republican senator used his time to quote Ayn Rand, which honestly perfectly set the scene for most Republican contributions to the hearing. He compared Howie to the man who discovered how to make fire. He was probably burnt at the stake he taught the others to light. Probably. Probably the one man who created fire by himself was burnt at the stake, because Homo erectus two million years ago were probably going around acting like 16th century Christians, weren't they? But that Ayn Randian trope, that great man theory nonsense about history being built by great men and their even greater minds, armed with nothing but their own vision, as Rand says, this is what formed the foundation of Howard's defense against accusations of aggressive lawbreaking and worker intimidation. So like, how woke is Starbucks, really? And why, if it's seen as a liberal bastion of SJWry, are Republican senators so obsessed with defending it? Who is Howard Schultz? Who is this person of wealth who claims to be the face of the company that is at the forefront of conscious capitalism? Well, let's find out. Welcome to your first day at Starbucks, partner, partner, Peasant, where, where our mission statement is to inspire and nurture and destroy the human spirit. The hu one person, one cup, and one neighbor at a time. time. At Starbucks, we believe trans affirmative healthcare is a human right. Human right. Except sometimes in Canada, except in Tranada. Pick up your pronoun pin in the employee lounge located between the ice machine and the garbage can. If you hear screaming, no, you don't. No, no, you don't. At the end of your shift, you may collect your beans, your beans for this week, up to one pound. Any extra beans will be deducted from your paycheck. From from, from your paycheck. Any partners found discussing human rights will be terminated. Terminated. This is our guess third place in between work and home. Day and night, life and death, we exist outside of it all. So leave your worries at the door, remember to smile, and greet every customer. The cameras are watching and write-ups will be collected before the end of your shift. Partner. Welcome to your first day as a partner at Starbucks. To begin our onboarding, let's watch a training video which highlights the legacy of Starbucks and our great leader and founder. Inspirational! Howard Schultz was born a child and then aged a year annually. And now we'll just fast forward to his adult entrepreneurial enterprises because we're not paying you to watch films all day. 
After working selling Xerox machines, in the 70s Schultz moved on to selling appliances for a European kitchenware company. It was during this time that he used his great man powers to discover espresso machines, something that had existed for about 100 years and which were incredibly common on the European continent. But not long after that, Howard made another incredible discovery. Armed with nothing but his own vision, he traversed the Atlantic to the foreign realm of Italy, where he stumbled upon a little known thing called a cafe. It was his eureka moment. His life would never be the same again. He was unstoppable, first espresso, then cafes, but things really started to heat up when he made his third discovery. He discovered this already existing company called Starbucks, a coffee roastery based in Seattle, actually founded by Jerry Baldwin, Zev Siegel, and Gordon Bowker in 1971. He begged them to let him work for them, and though at first they were like, uh, eventually he became the director of marketing, but they should have stuck to their gut. His plan was to convince them to change their entire business model in order to fulfill his visionary, revolutionary dream of Italian cafes, but America. But the founders of Starbucks were not so enthused. They just wanted to roast their little beans and had little interest in setting up a franchise of cafes. So Howard did it all by himself with $150,000 of funding from Starbucks, opening several small cafes named Il Giornale, which tried their best to emulate the cafe Schultz had discovered in Italy. But ultimately, they didn't make much of a splash. By 1987, the founders of Starbucks had purchased another coffee roastery, Pete's, and wanted to focus their efforts on roasting. And so after Schultz convinced some very rich people to give him very more money, 3.8 million, they sold the company to him. He had a bumpy start. American customers didn't quite take to the full-on pseudo-Italian vibe with the wooden chairs, constant opera, and bitter tiny coffees. Maybe because nothing is giving America less than opera and tiny portions. But luckily, Howard Schultz, just in time, somehow made even more remarkable advancements in cafe technology. This time, he invented sofas, jazz, and ice. And lo, the Starbucks we know today was born. You might be surprised to find that Schultz didn't actually found Starbucks and that the most innovating he did was copying Italy and persuading investors, especially given the way he's talked about by fellow capitalists. You might be surprised by that because as of writing this, there's no mention of the actual founder's names in the company history on the Starbucks website. Even the official first 50 years of Starbucks video on their YouTube channel just brushes past it, saying three friends before a cheesy as frack transition to Schultz's arrival, played over an uplifting and inspirational score. 10 years later, a young New Yorker named Howard Schultz traveled to Seattle and walked down the market's cobblestone streets for the first time and into Starbucks. But these three friends, they shall never be named. And this has been the case ever since Schultz waged an aggressive campaign to outcompete the actual founder's new ventures. He would buy properties and open Starbucks cafes, not just next to Pete's Roasteries, but he also went after one of the founder's godsons when he tried to start a roasting company called Quartermain. At one point, Schultz tried to mess up the lease for a new Quartermain property, and when the landlord wouldn't agree, he just tried to buy the whole building. So let's recap so far. Aggressively aiming to monopolize markets, trying to put people whom he called friends and mentors out of business, and then their families out of business, threatening to split the anti-Trump vote if Democrats elected a pro-worker candidate, and breaking hundreds of labor laws. This is conscious capitalism, really? He presents himself as a rare combination of archetypes, a visionary entrepreneur who's built an $84 billion global empire on pricey lattes, and a bleeding heart do-gooder who lavishes health coverage, college tuition, and other benefits on those 330,000 partners, has them undergo racial bias training and write come together on customers' coffee cups. 
As well as being an innovative genius, Schultz claims that Starbucks is unprecedented in the cool and groovy ways it treats its workers, or partners as he insists on calling them. I never liked that, by the way. He loves to talk about how worker rights have always been at the core of his vision for the company, telling the story of his World War II veteran father who was fired from his job after injury. Howard vowed to be the change he wished to see in capitalism and promised to build a company which exceeds the expectations of its workers. To Sanders, he quite pointedly brags about establishing shared ownership of the company, referring to Beanstalk, the stock options available to Starbucks workers on top of the very slightly better average pay rate than the minimum wage. I, the billionaire, I mean, person of means, capitalist, and more socialist than you. Charles Marx would like me better than you, Bernice. Put that in your basket and brew it. The way they talk about the perks of being a partner is a sight to behold. Starbucks offered access to healthcare 25 years before the Affordable Care Act. They offer 100% paid college tuition for any partner who wants to take a four-year college degree. They offer sick leave, parental leave. They even hire military veterans and their wives for coming out loud. And they have an employee retention rate, which is twice the industry average. So they must be doing something, right? Right? Right. Wrong. The word unprecedented is used so many times to describe Starbucks benefits, I couldn't even begin to count because I can't count. But are we potentially not being unfair here? Who are we to judge? We don't work there anymore. So let's look at what some partners have to say of their own free will in a room that definitely isn't armed with several vents hooked up to canisters of carbon monoxide set to go off if they happen to like say something disparaging or blurt out a desperate cry for help. The best part of my job are the unprecedented benefits we get as well. Every week we are allowed to re re receive one bag of beans as payment for our labor as well. That's roughly 3,200 to 5,500 coffee beans every week as well. And after a long closing shift of throwing out thousands of dollars of perfectly good food we aren't allowed to take, I like to go home and pop a couple of beans in my mouth and move them around. It's just like eating. After I was hate crimed on my way to work, I was so lucky to have Starbucks unprecedented industry leading health coverage. At first, I was worried I wouldn't be able to pay my rent with $200 a month disability payments. And I was right. I considered selling the beans I'd saved up on eBay, but <laughs> I was informed I would be found <laughs> and then fired <laughs> or worse. <laughs> Working retail can be tough. Luckily, with an hour of free partner access to Headspace a month, I was able to pull myself back off that ledge and really center myself. It's so much easier to get through the day when you remind yourself this is as good as it gets. <laughs> Unprecedented. I'm a student and Starbucks pays for nearly all of my tuition. I don't have time for class most days and I have to be up at 4 a.m. to work. So I don't have time for like sleep either. And <laughs> most days they make me stay late. So I'm failing a few of my labs. But the important thing is to remember that help me the windows or TV screens. I think we're underground. They took me by my house in Nebraska. <laughs> I mean, they all sounded so happy. Look at that smile. If that's not genuine, unbridled joy, then I simply don't know what is. Maybe you was wrong about old Howie. Speaking about getting paid, I want to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, Surfshark VPN. Surfshark is a mobile app and web browser extension that lets you put your computer or phone anywhere in the world so you can surf the web like you're in that place. Plus, it encrypts your online data to provide an additional layer of security while you're online, safeguarding all your passwords, videos, photos. Surfshark gives you so many features to protect yourself, like checking for potential breaches with Surfshark Alert, scanning your device for viruses, and protecting your identity. And then there's the biggest bonus, to me at least, you can watch streaming services that are blocked in your country. As a Canadian, trying to get content is annoying. They're like, no, no, you loony, no. But with Surfshark VPN, I press a little button, boop, and oh, hey, now it is. You gotta love it. Surfshark is the only VPN that allows one account to be used on an unlimited number of devices. They even say you can share with your friends, which is very cool, and more companies should be doing this. 
With Surfshark's 30-day money-back guarantee, there ain't nothing to lose. Try it out for yourself. Secure your privacy with Surfshark. Enter coupon code Kalen for four months extra at surfshark.com slash Kalen. Just click the link down in the description so you can support me and surf the web safely from anywhere. Okay, break's over. Time to come back to work. Howard claims that the reason they could offer all of the amazing benefits you just heard about was by building a direct relationship with our partners, built on trust and shared success, based on a 40-year track record of benefits and actions to create opportunity. A union would only get in the way of this direct, trusting, and unprecedented relationship, surely. So in 1986, one full year before Schultz bought the company and 10 years before I was born, Starbucks workers secured health care, paid vacation, and paid sick leave for even part-time workers through voting to unionize with the UFCW. Before Schultz took over Starbucks, hundreds of thousands of hospitality workers in the US had full benefits due to their participation with the UFCW. Now that's what I call precedented. Boom. Roasted. Speaking of Schultz's claims of personally bringing rights to the poor, downtrodden working class, one UFCW organizer said, That contract was in effect for decades before Schultz declared that he was the first to offer coverage for part-timers. It's just not plausible that he was unaware of this fact. Another union organizer from those early days, Anne Belov, said, Right before Howard took the company, he told us, I know you guys just signed a union contract. I will honor that contract. And then as soon as the papers were signed, he went back on that and required us to go into new negotiations. In the roasting plant, it got a whole lot worse after Howard took over. When he reneged on honoring our contract, that really did it. Starting as he meant to go on, Schultz decided to offer better benefits than the union was proposing to non-unionized workers in an attempt to disincentivize unionizing only to then, rather precedentedly, claw back on those commitments. It's like my Aunt Carla always said. Billies always be stealing bennies. Eventually, and allegedly due to interference from Starbucks, that union was decertified, which obviously meant all the contracts they had secured with Starbucks were no longer valid. Schultz claims that this decertification came at the result of an individual Starbucks barista who filed a petition because freedom and choice or whatever. However, these claims have been directly contradicted by union organizers at the time who claim that Starbucks management were absolutely involved. And this was just the beginning of decades worth of enthusiastic anti-union action by Starbucks under the consciously capitalist woke eye of Howard Soron Schultz. And then Starbucks just pulled the same tactic again. They tell them, oh, we'll give non-unionized stores loads of cool shit, so you better not unionize. And then they don't. And they're like, lol, not really psych. They did this in 1992 after spending a year and a half negotiating contracts with 12 stores and a distribution plant in British Columbia. British Columbia, which is neither in Britain nor Colombia. Coincidence? I not think. During the hearing, while around 300 stores in the US had voted to unionize, Starbucks had failed to sign a single contract. In the hearing, Sanders asked Schultz if he would commit to exchanging proposals with the union, something that is refused to do for more than 450 days, so that meaningful progress can be made. 450 days. So where did we leave off? Oh right, the 1990s. So let's hop forward a couple years to 2004, when pro-union sentiment was once again bubbling among the baristas with support from the IWW. Starbucks, of course, responded in the manner to which they were accustomed, by firing union organizers, spying on staff at non-work events, prohibiting conversations about wages or unionizing, issuing negative evaluations for organizers, and generally making things quite uncomfy and a little bit scary for workers who have sick fetishes for things like their rights, at least according to an administrative judge for the NLRB in 2008 which is why Starbucks was forced to reinstate workers they had wrongfully dismissed, ordered by a ruling which, according to union lawyer Stuart Lichten, conclusively establishes Starbucks' animosity towards labor organizing. For the first time, a judge has confirmed the existence of a nationally coordinated anti-union operation at Starbucks. 
However, as murky as that history is, Starbucks has turned the anti-union action up to 11. And there's loads more stuff that happened in those decades between the 80s and now. To chronicle it all, it's too much. You could fill a book, but I won't because I'm already writing a better one. <gasps> Shock, gasp, watch this space. For example, in 2011, unionized workers in Chile responded to corporate union busting there by launching Starbucks' first ever strike. But after two weeks of strike action, Starbucks didn't even look up. And so organizers had to go on a literal hunger strike, all for slightly better wages and healthcare. Since then, Starbucks workers have held over 450 days of strikes at over 190 locations, the longest of which lasted 65 days when Boston workers walked out and picketed their store. They were fighting against an increase to worker availability, the number of hours that you're expected to be available to work, but you obviously don't get paid for, and you also can't do anything useful with, like get a second job, even though you definitely need one if you want to afford luxuries like food or necessities like lube. But since 2021, when workers in a store in Buffalo voted to unionize, making it the only store of over 9,000 stores at the time in the U.S. to do so, Starbucks went feral, absolutely buck wild with the union busting. The NLRB filed over 80 complaints against Starbucks for violating labor laws. Over 500 unfair labor practice charges have been lodged against the company. Judges have found that Starbucks broke the law 136 times across six states since 2021. On March 1st, 2023, an administrative judge found Starbucks guilty of egregious and widespread misconduct, which showed a general disregard to the employee's fundamental rights. That judge found that Starbucks had illegally retaliated against unionizing workers, promised improved benefits if workers didn't unionize, conducted illegal surveillance of workers, and refused to hire pro-union candidates or relocate pro-union workers, concluding that Starbucks had engaged in widespread coercive behavior. Mr. Schultz, before answering the following questions, let me remind you that federal law prohibits knowingly and willfully making any fraudulent statement. I understand that. Are you aware that on March 1st, 2023, an administrative law judge found Starbucks guilty of, quote, egregious and widespread misconduct, end quote, widespread coercive behavior, and showed, quote, a general disregard for the employee's fundamental rights, end quote, in a union organizing campaign that started in Buffalo, New York in 2021. Are you aware of that? I'm aware that those are allegations. Have you ever threatened, coerced, or intimidated a worker for supporting a union? I've had conversations that could have been interpreted in a different way than I intended. That's up to the person who received the information that I spoke to him about. Were you informed of or involved in the decision to withhold benefits from Starbucks workers in unionized stores, including higher pay and faster sick time accrual. My understanding was under the law, we did not have the unilateral right to provide those benefits to employees who were interested in joining a union. Am I hearing you say that you were involved in the decision to withhold benefits from Starbucks workers in unionized stores? Is that what I'm hearing? It was my understanding that we could not provide those benefits under the law. In Buffalo, Starbucks has been ordered to reinstate seven wrongly terminated workers, reopen stores which were illegally closed, and pay damages to more than two dozen workers whose rights had been violated. Courts in Tennessee and Michigan issued emergency injunctions forcing Starbucks to reinstate workers. In Arizona, the NLRB charged Starbucks with eight labor law violations for firing workers for cooperating with a literal federal investigation. Like, sure, don't talk to the cops, but I'm not siding with the Goran billionaires over the feds either, please. The NLRB found that Starbucks had failed to recognize or bargain with the union at a roastery in Seattle. Judges even found that Starbucks illegally threatened to withhold benefits, including health insurance, from pro-union workers in Denver, Kansas, Seattle, and Michigan. Quite the list, isn't it? How do they find the time? You know what, they're right. CEOs are busier than normal, average, disgusting workers. I don't work at Starbucks anymore. I actually kind of work like 
for you. <laughs> so if you want to pay me for my labor, you can do that at patreon.com slash Conrad, where you can get ad-free videos, extra videos, Discord access, and more. And let me know in the comments if you want another video about how horrible Starbucks treats its partners from someone who worked there for a decade. Back when I did work at Starbucks a few years ago, I was trying to unionize my store. It was less than a year into the ongoing pandemic, spurred on by a store in Victoria, British Columbia, that made waves by voting to unionize. In a panicked, desperate plea to regain control, Starbucks had the district manager in each district have calls with everyone in every store, including myself, who was on sick leave at the time. It was a load, a bull shirt. Our district manager all of a sudden was feigning interest in addressing the issues we've been reporting for years, yet claiming the reason why a union would cause issues was due to management not being able to address complaints without going through the union first. Basically this, if you unionize, we'll no longer be able to do the thing you're unionizing into forcing us to do because we have no interest or intent in making that happen otherwise. Right. At the time, I was a supervisor, and although I was on sick leave, I was in contact with a union rep that had worked with my father. I'm a union baby. It's like a Nepo baby, but instead of getting a free job, I got a debilitating conscience. Thanks, study. There was definitely interest in unionizing amongst the co-workers who at the time were growing increasingly uncomfortable with the dynamic in the store, as the manager was an open secret that everyone knew about, but nobody felt comfortable reporting. We had zero faith in corporate to take our concerns seriously. Zero. But the meeting had scared some of the staff. There was talks of removing health insurance and other benefits, things most of my coworkers depended on to cover medical costs, like prescriptions and therapy. Corporate would allot so little labor, even during the busiest times, and with Uber Eats and mobile ordering, sometimes even an empty store would require at least six people working nonstop to fulfill orders, bust the cafe, run breaks, and do all the behind the scenes stuff, like cleaning tasks. But instead of those six people, there would be two. My plans to unionize the store, even if I was never able to go back to it, were born of a deep respect for my coworkers and a deep disrespect for corporate. The only thing I liked at that job was the people I worked with, who were generally some of the hardest working people I've ever met. Definitely more than me. By far. Like, very far. Sorry, guys. By the time I left, I was so burned out and disillusioned that if I had to do more than the barest barest minimum, I was grumpy as hell. And this is so far from where I started. I actually loved Starbucks when I first got hired. I loved making drinks. I liked making people smile, making their days better. I still do, and that's actually one of the coolest parts of doing this job. I spent years breaking my back for Starbucks to earn my 10 cent an hour raise that I get every six months. I was asked to give up sleep, family events, even miss funerals for the company. And I did, because I was told doing so might ensure a future where I could afford my medications and rent at the same time. But the disillusionment grew steadily. The things the company asked for became more and more unreasonable. Targets we would never have been projected to reach became the bare minimum. We were taught that the most important thing about the job was the customer experience. And then corporate did everything they could to demolish that experience and left us to deal with the angry customers and all the blame. There were so many times I was so close to quitting, but I wouldn't have had the health insurance that at the time my partner and I were relying on. I knew that things were terrible, yes, but I hoped that things could eventually be better. But I was far past naive enough to think that corporate had any interest in bettering things for the people in the stores. The only way forward with Starbucks I could see was through unionization. But trying to convince people to unionize when you can't even talk to them in person is incredibly difficult. And most of the workers had already decided to quit sometime in the next year due to the working conditions, and subsequently didn't feel especially motivated to vote on a union. Not to mention that many were in fear that they just shut the store down. There were 20 more in a five block radius, after all it's downtown Toronto, and management had become much more present and much more vigilant in the stores, since the whispers of unionizing were spreading. In 10 years at Starbucks, the most attention my fellow partner's concerns ever received was during that period. We got more support during that time than when there was a shooting in the food court of the mall we were working in, at my first store, a kiosk nicknamed The Hellmouth by those partners in the city. And we weren't even alone in feeling this new concern wasn't concern for us, but for the capital and power of those in charge. During the hearing, we heard from Starbucks workers and their stories were strikingly similar to what my coworkers were scared would happen to them if they attempted to unionize. 
I said, fuck it anyway, let's do it. Come on, I wanna. But I wasn't in the store and I would never return. COVID changed a lot for a lot of people. Mr. Saxton, a disabled army vet and union organizer at Starbucks, was wrongly fired by the company for his organizing efforts. He said that once workers at his store began organizing, upper management were just there for no apparent reason all the time. Starbucks has thousands of stores. If district managers and regional managers are always showing up at your store watching you, you know something's up. In February 2022, we heard about the Memphis 7, a high profile case of retaliation and termination against a group of mostly workers of color. Their firing had a chilling effect on me and my coworkers as we saw the company betraying the very values and mission that these Memphis workers were upholding. Despite our fears, we were inspired by the courage and power of the Memphis 7 and filed for our election a month later in March 2022. A week after we filed, they replaced a sympathetic store manager, but it backfired as more people got on board with the union. In April, our store won our election by a landslide 26 to 5, despite all of the threats and intimidation. Starbucks retaliation and union busting ramped up even more after we won our election. We were constantly being watched and managers listened in on our conversations through our headsets. Store hours were constantly changing and hours kept getting cut. People were fired right on the shop floor. They fired seven of our union members, two of them were shift supervisors. Two partners requested medical and maternity leave, management refused to sign off on their leave, and they were terminated. Several people quit, including my wife. Some of us were told that we should look for another job. In July, I led a two-day unfair labor practice strike and delivered our demands. A month later, I was fired for supposedly being disruptive. I was fired after organizing like so many union leaders across the country. Starbucks and big corporations have a lot of power and money, and they are willing to pull out all the stops to deny workers a voice and a seat at the table in a union. That's why I'm thrilled to be here today to have witnessed firsthand Howard Schultz being held to account for his company's illegal behavior. We are coming together to demand better pay, affordable health coverage, and stronger safety procedures. I'm proud to be a leader of this new labor movement. We're taking on corporate power and fighting for all of us. One day, my daughter is going to be able to look up her dad on the internet and find out that I fought for a better future for every Starbucks worker and for all working people. And I know she'll also read that we took on one of the most powerful corporations and won. That's why I keep fighting, and that makes everything worth it. Maggie Carter, single mom, barista, and union organizer from Knoxville, recalls her team being forced into a captive audience meeting with upper management who had traveled in the middle of the pandemic to pressure workers and then give them COVID. So my name is Maggie Carter, and I'm a single mom to a beautiful eight-year-old boy named Colson. Being his mom is the absolute greatest gift of my life. He's why I ended up at Starbucks the only place to offer me part-time benefits and what I thought would be flexible scheduling while in school. As a lesbian, I was also drawn to Starbucks by its reputation as a progressive employer. You know, we were forced to go through multiple captive audience meetings in our store, and our store was the only one to stay open throughout the entirety of the pandemic. Unfortunately, because of a captive audience meeting, a member of management who traveled to our store from, I don't know where, I had never met them before, uh, gave multiple partners COVID in this meeting, and we had to shut down for five days. Now, that's a little bit of union busting and outside experiences, but kind of uh, crazy to Did go Did workers that. have any option about whether or not they would undergo this meeting with the uh, uh, Starbucks uh, executive? We were scheduled for that meeting, and, and it actually was our very first one. So we weren't uh, told at this point in time that we didn't have to attend. So we, it was very much not an option. Partners suddenly started getting disciplined for minor dress code violations or being five or so minutes late. Every day, it felt as if there was a concerted effort to build a case against partners who showed even the smallest bit of support for the union. Days prior to ballots being mailed out for the election, managers closed our store for hour long periods, most during peak operating times, to hold impromptu captive audience meetings. It felt like the company was suddenly paying full attention to us and were willing to throw absolutely anything at us to deter us from organizing. Schultz has made a career selling the idea of offering benefits to part-time workers because he wanted to operate a different kind of company. I'm a single mother working tirelessly for this company for four years, and I'm certainly not alone in feeling nothing but left behind during a time where everything we knew about the world was uncertain. 
You cannot be pro-partner and anti-union. Starbucks was accused of outright refusing to negotiate with unionized stores, walking out of meetings, delaying efforts, closing stores. As Ms. Carter states, We won our vote one year ago today, March 29th, 2022. Since then, we've made every attempt to try to bargain in good faith with the company. Starbucks walked out on our store's only scheduled bargaining session after just 30 minutes. This cartoon bad guy shit is honestly a bit much. Decades worth of union busting, hundreds of complaints, laws broken all over the place, managers traipsing in to give workers COVID. Seriously, how do they even keep this up? Easy. Pay someone else to help you harm your workers. Starbucks is worth around $100 billion. And some of those dollars have gone to Littler Mendelssohn PC, which some people call a union busting firm, a categorization which Howie adamantly rejects because apparently he never read their homepage. With significant depth in traditional labor practices, Littler understands the mindset of union organizers and stands ready to advise employers facing such tactics. Our deep experience in representing management serves as a strong counterpoint to the world's most powerful labor organizations. We guide companies in developing and initiating strategies that lawfully avoid unions or effectively respond to unconventional corporate campaigns. If the union attempts labor actions to gain leverage, such as a strike, we help employers develop plans to assist in keeping operations running. Not gonna lie, bust in unions seems to be their entire jam. And like if it were a vicious mischaracterization, you'd think, uh, what do you call a group of lawyers? Gaggle? Troop? Murder? Well, you think they'd be well equipped to do something about it, wouldn't you? If it were provably false in any way at all? But the worst part is, you don't even need to hire a batch of expensive anti-union lawyers to get away with disregarding labor laws, especially not if you're one of the biggest companies in the world. The worst that can happen is you're forced to rehire someone or pay a teeny tiny fine out of your literal pocket change. But that's not the worst thing that can happen, is it? It's the worst thing that will happen. No, the worst thing that can happen is your workers take some control over business operations, that they have some autonomy over their working conditions. The worst thing would be having to concede your power. And that's why we hire a herd of lawyers. Schultz's defenses against these accusations are the weakest shit you've ever heard. In regards to not offering benefits to unionizing workers, including removing their trans-affirming care and cutting their hours. Uh, Mr. Schultz, yes or no, does Starbucks provide employees with generous benefits like health care, paid parental leave, and college scholarships? Yes. And you're proud that Starbucks does that? Very proud. I understand that part-time employees need to work at least 240 hours over the course of three consecutive months or roughly 20 hours a week. So I understand that Starbucks has a widespread pattern of reducing worker hours in stores that have unionized. Um, after conversations with constituents from New Mexico, um, that's what I've learned. Um, and why does Starbucks reduce workers' hours at unionized stores? I'm not aware we do that, sir. No, no. The reason that I asked the question about the reduction in hours, Mr. Schultz, is I certainly commend and appreciate what uh, decisions were made about respecting employees, about valuing employees as well. Mr. Schultz, you announced in May 2022 that the company would raise pay and double training hours at its more than 10,000 corporate owned stores, but you said that these changes and others would not apply to unionized stores or stores where workers had filed for union elections. Mr. Schultz, yes or no, did you say this? Uh, yes. He said he was never involved in any meetings, didn't know anything about improper actions by management. He wasn't personally involved anyway. He was just the CEO. What did he know? And anyway, did you know that probably the workers who want to unionize, they're just paid infiltrators. Nobody wants to unionize, couldn't be. No, it's just paid infiltrators all the way down. But I want to share with the committee uh, what we have found out about the organizing in Buffalo. And I think this is important for everyone to know. The organizing in Buffalo began with an individual who we later found out was paid for and joined Starbucks as an employee in 2020. And even though we hired her on her own merit, we found out that she was paid for by the very union trying to organize Starbucks. So as you might imagine, uh, 
We're very curious to understand what happened in Buffalo. And uh, we later found out that this individual, which, which was hired in 2020, was paid for and under the employment of the union that was basically trying to organize Starbucks. We later found out there was more than one person. And so you might want to ask yourself, uh, what, where's the fairness, right. the objectivity, and the integrity of what we're, we're talking about here today? He claims that any inappropriate things he might have said have been taken out of context, like when he shouted down a pro-union worker saying, if they hate Starbucks so much, why don't you go work somewhere else? He says this is a matter of his rights, actually saying, I have the right and the company has the right to have a preference. And our preference is to maintain the direct relationship we've had with our employees. It's about free speech, you see. Obviously not the free speech of the workers who were being spied on, who were being prevented from discussing certain topics during the breaks. No, the important free speech here is the freedom of the giant corporation and the multi-billionaire to be loudly, aggressively, consistently anti-union, anti-worker, all while maintaining a reputation of being left and woke. But that's not union busting, silly. That's just speech. Telling workers that they will lose hours and benefits is just speech. It's just words coming out of my mouth. It's like my Uncle Sam used to say. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words are protected under the First Amendment. I guess Howie thinks that speech doesn't do stuff. Unless it's pro-union speech, which is obviously insidious, corrosive, and frankly, un-American. He is so comfy, so sure of himself, so buffered by his billions that he sits there with a straight friggin' face in front of people who have eyes and ears, and on one hand claims to understand that the right to unionize is, by law, entirely up to workers, while on the other raving about how it's his fundamental human right to run a company, which makes it clear that you absolutely should not unionize, you ungrateful plebes. Howard Schultz takes this shit personally. Throughout the hearing, he behaved as if this whole thing was an affront to his character, as if only bad men with the naughty little companies need unionized workers. Only the dirty little CEOs need daddy government to show them how to treat their partners. And so if they're saying they need a union, that's basically like spitting in his face, stomping on his reputation. It's essentially slander if you don't think about it, which I haven't. And this is especially given all those amazing, unprecedented, absolutely in no way conditional or out of reach for most workers shiny benefits. What on earth could one possibly have to gain from collective bargaining? This man ordered a venti paternalism with no room. Workers' rights were never handed over by CEOs. They were fought for, won after years of literal bloodshed through the collective organization of workers from all manner of industries. Schultz loves to appropriate the spirit of his veteran father as part of his defense and political campaigns, but union organizers within America's labor movement have fought harder for the country, shown more patriotism and love for Americans, sacrifice, lost, and more than Howard Schultz could ever imagine, even if we allowed him the valor he'd stolen from his father. And importantly, the point of unionizing is not simply to win benefits and wages, which could theoretically also be gifted by the owners of capital. It's to gain power, control over the material conditions in which you have to spend eight hours every day, some autonomy over what you do and how you do it, some say over the business practices, over how the company to which you are dedicating most of your time operates. Schultz spends some time bragging about Beanstalk, smirking at Bernie Sanders as he explains the unprecedented nature of such shared ownership. Workers literally owning the means of production. Case closed, capitalism does communism even better. So pack up your twinks, your mistresses, and your poppers, and go home, senators. But are beans power? What do you really gain if the moment you leave the company, you lose all your stocks? What share in the company do you really have if every year you need to cash out those stocks for $600 so you can afford new clothes and shoes to ruin at work? Schultz shares a touching story that happened very coincidentally on the very morning of the very hearing. Would you very believe? <laughs> he had gone to a Starbucks to grab a drink on the way into the hearing and he met the manager. I walked into a store an hour ago, just at 24th and M, just walked in was met by a guy named Nico, never met him before. 22 years with Starbucks, and he tells me his story. He came from Senegal, he's an American citizen, started out as a barista, became a manager, 
district manager. And the thing that he wanted me to know, this is an hour ago, is I bought a house and I have a car and I raised two kids because of Beanstalk at Starbucks. 22 years of grind, pun intended, lol, and selling his stock options to get a secure place to live, transport, and food on your family's table? These are things we should be calling the bare minimum, I would say. Things a manager who had been with the company for two decades should have been able to afford with their salary the very first year they started. But this wholesome little tidbit betrays the truth. Beanstalk isn't a transfer of ownership. Not if the only benefit it awards you is the money you get when you sell it. It's more of a savings scheme, one which depends entirely on the reputation of the company. So better not say anything bad about it, eh? That's not power. That's not control. That's not autonomy. That's literally beans. And most recently, Starbucks has faced backlash for its lawsuit against the union, Starbucks Workers United. Starbucks condemned and subsequently initiated legal action against Starbucks Workers United after a tweet was posted featuring the text Solidarity with Palestine, with an image of a bulldozer breaking through the Gaza fence. Authored by an individual without approval from union leaders, the tweet was soon deleted and later replaced with a broader statement expressing solidarity with Palestine. Starbucks basically accused the union of associating support for violence perpetuated by Hamas with the Starbucks brand because of the use of their name and logo in the union branding. In response, the union said Starbucks was seeking to exploit the ongoing tragedy in Gaza and Israel to bolster an anti-union campaign by falsely attacking the union's reputation with workers and the public. It's a sad day when a billionaire can't even say that the union they're trying to crush is in league with Hamas anymore because of woke. Starbucks' actions against the union have been widely perceived as retaliation for their stance on Palestine, motivating many to boycott the company, including myself, for this and many more reasons which you've heard. I recently asked someone I used to work with how the boycott, the union busting, the way Starbucks' reputation as some leftist champion of human rights has suffered in the last few years, like how all that's affected them as a cafe employee. And they had this to say. During the boycott, I was given so few hours. For months, my hours and pay was reduced by more than 25%. If I was lucky, I was getting around 22 hours as a full-time supervisor. The baristas felt very resentful as well. And I'd say some even lost benefits because they didn't meet the 20 hour a week requirement. We also had to deal with the fact that we were now working harder for less money because hours were being cut. This created a really tense work environment. It was like corporate wouldn't acknowledge it. When customers and baristas brought it up to me, all I could do was listen to their thoughts and opinions on the matter. And many were upset that Starbucks was not addressing the issues. And Starbucks didn't address it with us. We were being paid so much less to work so much harder because Starbucks was scheduling less people partners were bringing in canned soup and crackers because they couldn't afford transportation and healthy groceries. I worked at Starbucks for almost two decades. I've been here through everything, through thick and thin. I've seen the company change in ways I never even thought were possible. COVID drastically created an unsafe environment within our stores, and we never felt as though we were asked by corporate what we needed to feel safer. And there was a lot we could have done. We are operating now as if COVID never happened, except for a few small changes. What once felt like a literal second home to me is now a very cold and sterile environment. What made Starbucks feel special to us has long since died. And it's only gonna get worse. Starbucks recently fired their last CEO, who is apparently too soft on unions for their taste, and hired this goon, Brian Nickel from fast food giant Chipotle. Brian refused to go work from their corporate headquarters in Seattle, so he'll be taking a private jet to and from work. We're on a thousand miles. But you still can't have a plastic straw. You gotta do your part, you filthy little planet killers. So why did they choose Brian Nickel? Well, apparently under Nickel's rule, Chipotle was engaging in illegal union busting, shutting down stores that successfully unionized. Chipotle even had to pay out $240,000 over that. And more worrisome, they also had to pay out for violating child labor laws in Massachusetts, New Jersey, and Washington, DC. Starbucks is the worst kind of capitalist machine, the kind that pretends to be anything but. Sidebar, if I had the chance, I'd 100% put Howard Schultz into a different kind of capitalist machine, just for billies like him. If you're a Starbucks worker, I just wanna say I love you, I appreciate you, and I hope things get better for you because you deserve better. We all deserve better. 
I'm lucky to be doing this full time now, but I was with Starbucks for a decade and it was often the most demoralizing and demeaning position I would be put in. The way management allows customers to speak to you, the way your life and your happiness is always secondary to scheduling and underscheduling, it's wrong. You're worth so much more than they tell you. I just hope you know that. And that goes for pretty much everyone out there working for these CEOs that bleed you dry until there's nothing left but someone with nothing left to lose. I'm proud to be a leader of this new labor movement. We're taking on corporate power and fighting for all of us. One day, my daughter is gonna be able to look up her dad on the internet and find out that I fought for a better future for every Starbucks worker and for all working people. And I know she'll also read that we took on one of the most powerful corporations and won. That's why I keep fighting and that makes everything worth it. Thanks to Ember for helping out with the research and script for this video and check out her videos. There's one about how she loved being a barista minus the customers and her entire channel, which is like YouTube essays made by an angel set against lo-fi music. Phenomenal. I mean, it's not like I woke up looking forward to going in or anything, but it was basically the only service job where I legitimately had some fun. Sometimes. Where I legitimately got on with my colleagues mostly, where I lasted longer than all the rest. A bit. Minus the occasional help from other writers like Ember, I do everything on this channel myself. See this set? I taught myself how to make this in Blender using YouTube tutorials. I usually work 10 to 18 hours a day, five to seven days a week so that I can make things like this for you for free. So if you want to support that work by getting some extras like a Patreon only Discord, these videos add and sponsor free, as well as access to exclusive videos and benefits like watch parties and getting your name in the credits, I would love that so much. I would like to get to a point where my Patreon is at a place where I don't have to take sponsors on videos like this one. They just kill the vibe sometimes, you know? If you can't, no big, but please give this video a like, comment, and share after you subscribe. I also have a second channel, Respect the Dead, the channel where we don't. It's a video podcast where we pick a usually terrible person from history and vent about them in a way that will make you realize that bullying is sometimes fine if you're only bullying dust. Okay, love you. Bye.